actually honored to be included in the event. And as you can tell, I'm not a woman. So it's, uh, you know, feeling uh, maybe touch out number, but it's actually really ironic. My, my entire team, so we're a, a fairly small team. There's six of us. And it's myself and five unbelievable women who have helped craft our business and quite frankly, craft a lot of what is taking place in the Canadian cannabis space. Um, Can Supplies is the leading, largest and probably leading supplier of uh, compliant packaging within the Canadian cannabis space. We've been in the market um, officially about five years. We were brought into it about seven years ago with Shoppers Drug Mart uh, when we started working on their, what was then Project Emerald uh, for the launch of medical cannabis uh, years ago as our parent company, Pharma Systems, is a uh, leading supplier to Shoppers Drug Mart for pharmacy supplies. And um, from then, we, you know, we, we sort of got into the space and uh, introduced a whole variety of packages. And today we're, we're supplying uh, just about 150 LPs with all forms of regulated packaging, facility supplies, ancillary um, products, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's been quite the, uh, quite the ride. So you know, from a bringing product to market, um, we've seen sort of the best of what can be done and some of what the worst can be done. Um, we, we actually were fortunate enough to be a part of the last two ADCAN um, Best in Packaging Awards. Um, we developed T-God's uh, Lean Jar, which is that beautiful glass, green glass jar that sits on its side and uh, involved in uh, Sundial's most recent win as well. So, you know, we've seen a lot of great things within the market. And, um, you know, I think early on, there was a lot of regulation, uh, which Trina can speak to, that was very prohibitive to what could be done in, in bringing a product to market and specifically with the packaging and the labeling being so cumbersome, um, it, it really opened the eyes to how products need to come to the space and really what the LPs wanted from whether it was a branding standpoint, um, a price profitability standpoint, or quite frankly, a production standpoint of what could be done at some of the larger production lines and some of the smaller sort of hand-to-hand -hand fill stations. So um, a lot of really cool stuff and excited to hear what the, uh, what the team's got going. Amazing. Thanks so much for, for thinking of me to be included on this as the moderator. I'm super excited. Um, the panelists that we have here today are all, all amazing. And I know I'm excited to hear some of their stories. And I think it'll be it'll be great for the audience as well. Um, as you said, my name is Pavel Kruba. I work for Peak Processing Solutions. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to work in business development. Um, so this is near and dear to my heart, this topic here. Um, I have the good fortune of speaking to a, a, a lot of groups about product development and bringing new products to market and kind of starting from ideation all the way through the process. So um, I have a little bit of experience in it, but uh, just looking at the, the panelists I have here today, um, I definitely think I will be outshined. So um, on that note, I will flip it over. Um, Trina or Tijan, Ashley, whichever, whichever you want to get it going. Trina, you're in my top left. So maybe flip it to you to introduce yourself and go from there. Okay, sure. I'm Trina. I'm a cannabis lawyer based in Ottawa at Brazos Seller Law and uh, super happy to be speaking to this panel because I, I love these success stories like uh, EKS and I'll turn it over to you guys to tell more about your story. Well, since I talked a lot last time, I'll kick it off to Ashley to introduce yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, my name is Ashley Short. I'm actually a holistic nutritionist, clinical herbalist, and one of the co-founders of Earth Kisses Sky. And my name is Tijan Yelchin, co-founder of Earth Kisses Sky. Both Ashley and I are life and business partners, believe it or not, together for 17 years. EKS has been around, if you don't remember the logo, here it is, um, <laughs> for 11 years now. And we create premium-based cannabis topicals that just uh, launched last week. And um, we have a background in health sciences. I, I used to work as a registered massage therapist, registered acupuncturist, and we retired our practice to focus mainly on uh, pivoting from products, or sorry, from service to products. And in helping people is very important to us. So um, yeah, that's us in a nutshell. Mm. Kick it over to whoever, Antoinette, I, I haven't seen you in a long time. Nice to see you again. Hey, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, the founder of the Green Rush program. It's a cannabis business accelerator. We connect um, entrepreneurs with the legal market by helping, just making it a lot more accessible 
giving people the education on cannabis history so we can understand why drug policy is the way it is today and why um, businesses need to be rolled out a certain way and um, connecting them with the right manufacturers to make sure that we can get those um, products to market. And we have over 200 mentors on the program. What I like is that it's really like the master class of weed. If you want to become like a cannabis chef or you want to own a cannabis retail company or if you want to have a product line or you want to just be a cultivator, we can make sure that you make them appropriate um, ways to get involved just by connecting you and giving you education and resources into the industry. Awesome. Thanks so much for those introductions. Um, we'll kind of kick it off here. I think the easiest way for me to start, the easiest place to start, um, understanding obviously that we are talking about a heavily regulated industry here um, and in the cannabis space, a lot of law to go around it. I think we'd go right to the expert and um, Trina kind of touching on that point that you talked about these success stories. And, and I think a, a lot of those come from non-licensed groups or entities coming into the space and producing an amazing product that, that the consumers really want and have an appetite for. So I wanted to pose the first kind of general question to you is, and how can you bring a cannabis product to market if you don't have a cannabis act license? Well, so, right. If, I mean, obviously, if you are a processor, then that entitles you to touch the plant, touch the, the derivatives of the plant and to manufacture and sell products. But if you don't have a license to do that, then you do have to engage in some sort of a partnership with a party who does, right? So um, outside of the cannabis industry, we would, we would think about contract manufacturing type relationships. And that's essentially what you need to do here as well if you are an unlicensed under the Cannabis Act brand owner. Um, but you know there are a few special regulatory wrinkles that you have to keep in mind. So in a traditional contract manufacturing relationship, you're hiring somebody to make a product for you, which you will then turn around and, and sell either you know, to just other distributors or customers. In the cannabis industry, if you don't hold a processing license, you won't be able to directly be part of the supply chain because you aren't licensed to, to possess or sell cannabis. So you will have to engage with a partner who will effectively do that for you. So typically those relationships are structured as licensing deals where you're licensing your intellectual property to that processor. So the brand, maybe a formulation as well, or a technology or process that you've developed that's proprietary. And then they are using your intellectual property to make the product and to turn around and then sell it ultimately to provincial distributors and retailers uh, and paying you a royalty for that. So that's essentially how you would typically see um, a brand owner structure their, their kind of entry into the industry. Awesome. Thanks so much. Now, Tijan and Asha, I'll kind of flip it over to you having gone through that process. Um, Trina makes it sound very, very simple, obviously, the way she lays it out. Um, I kind of want to get some of your experiences and, and was it in fact that easy or, or how was the experience? Just tell us about anything that you can share that that'll help anyone ultimately kind of following in your path. Well, I actually love this panel. I don't know if it was on purpose or, or coincidence, but Trina is our, is our lawyer and Favel, um, we partnered up with Peak Processing who holds the license to do exactly what Trina just mentioned. So um, the, the four of us on the screen here have been working a lot of hours to get this done. Trina has been with us even in the legacy market when we, we you know, she wasn't able to even support us if anything were to happen, but we, we did get her, get her on board with us way back when. But um, moving from getting this to happen, once you understand how Trina just laid this out, it is very, like doable before under, like, I wish I had that information way back in the day because I, we didn't really know exactly what the process would look like because no one was really doing it. So I think Trina, um, the legal is, is the most challenging for us because it is shape shifting constantly and trying to keep up with it was one of our biggest challenges. So what Trina just broke down, if you are interested in bringing a product to market, I would say that that would be the route that would make the most sense if you don't hold a processing license, because it is just, it's a lot of money to hold that license yourself. And why not just stay an expert at what you do and do mm -hmm. it well and, and have a team like Peak Processing, um, Pavel over at Peak Processing to manage all of the background stuff that we are not really interested in doing. And, um, and, and not just that, but the amount of capital that they would have had to invest to have that license. 
Um, and then we could just focus on being the face of the brand, executing our products and um, having it smooth process from there. But yeah, it was a challenge to get to that level because the information wasn't necessarily there. And I think when we did approach peak, we had a whole different agreement in place and Trina and the team, we all just looked at what makes the most sense. And then in the end, that's what we came up with. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. A little bit of a shameless plug there, but for sure, um, if, if Peak can help, definitely go to Peak. And uh, Anton, I kind of want to kick it over to you in terms of one, being a, a brand owner, and um, if you're looking into the process, but also this is kind of the area where of the consulting that, that you offer, and you have a lot of expertise and, and resources that you offer to two groups going through this, right? So um, I want to kind of kick it over to you and, and get your input on both sides of it. One, as, as a brand owner and also as a consultant and someone who helps groups kind of go through that process. Thank you. Um, yeah, as a brand owner and as a consultant are very different things. And I've been in this space for a really long time, eight years now, free legalization of uh, recreational use. So I've done a lot of things wrong. And I think that uh, when I get to teach people is that just not how to make those same mistakes, right? And it's been really interesting transferring into a very restrictive industry, but it's, I'm really happy that I'm in Canada because Canada is really, you know, spearheading the way for quality cannabis products that I think is a great opportunity if you're looking into that global opportunity when it comes to cannabis CPG related, you know, things like that. So what I love about teaching is that there's so many things that come to cannabis. It's, there's so many different types of products and, and businesses, right? But I guess since we're talking about products specifically today, is that we in Canada have a really restrictive framework, which means we have to be really um, innovative in our approach to bringing products to market. And you know, and if anybody knows me, knows I'm the loophole queen in this industry. There's a, I just know that there's always a way to get around certain things. Right now, I own a Pleasure Peaks, a cannabinoid sexual health company. I'm very excited to be bringing suppositories to the market. Um, but I'm always interested about I, you know industries that haven't been touched yet. Cannabis has the potential to help so many different um, ranges of people from, from age to de culture to demographic to pain that are just not really focused on, you know, and, and we really do focus on the recreational component a lot, but there's a lot of more opportunity within the medical component, which I'd love sharing within our education because it shows why we're here today. How did we get cannabis legal? It has really been built off the backs of access to patients, right? And we're still not done there. So if you're an entrepreneur, what I like to say is that there's a lot more easier non-plant touching um, businesses to start to see where you really feel fit within this industry to find your passion and then bring that to market with your real product, right? And what I love now is that when I started this, like so long ago before licensed producers were even a thing, um, it was very, it were very few to work with. Now there's hundreds, which is wonderful. And many of them have their own white label models. So what I love is to share with different entrepreneurs, all of the different ways that you can cut the buy. And like Tijan says, there's, there's many ways, but there might be ways that are better for you. You don't have to really be the grower and cultivator if you're just trying to big, bring a product to market, right? So there's a lot of ways that you can cut years out of your life just by, out of the business life by just bringing a product to market by networking and knowing those right people and mentorship. This industry is so small, um, but once you, it's really hard to penetrate, which is why I love the, the Green Rush program. It makes it a lot more accessible for people. And thank you for that. I think you, you touched on some, some very important points and some, some great points, and um, especially in that net, networking piece. At this point, Mark, I really want to hand it over to you um, I, I know from the onset, kind of when you're talking about these these products and when you're thinking of bringing a product to market, there was so much that you yourself had, had to handle um, as a brand owner. And now um, with other groups coming in and offering assistance, Mark, I think um, this is where, where your company comes into play and and offering that that solution, that quick, easy solution to a piece that um, in the space is unregulated, however, carries so much weight and is so important for the viability of these products. So I, I wanted to ask you from a pack, packaging standpoint, um, when someone does come to speak to you about a new product idea or concept, what kind of things do you take into consideration? Maybe how do those conversations vary uh, between a licensed entity and a non-licensed entity? Sure. I mean, it's a very good question and it's changed dramatically from, you know, I think, I think we really started to see an influx of interest probably about 
probably about 12 months before legalization, where we had companies that were sort of, you know, Gen 1, larger, well-capped um, companies come and look, and they had large projections. So very early on, we had some customers that were ordering, you know, our, our first order for a large LP was about three and a half million jars. And this was a year and a half before legalization, just getting sort of ducks in a row. And I think everyone was going off of a number of assumptions, both in terms of run rate, how much they were going to sell, how many stores there would be. And then, you know, obviously everything changed very quickly. The rule that wasn't necessarily as quick and smooth as possible. Um, some of the regulations, which people felt were going to come into the market did not actually materialize. And we saw them come through 2.0 regulations, things like flag labels or other ways to sort of minimize the physical size of the packaging. Um, whereas today there's a lot more opportunity to sort of um, take some of those loopholes into account, I think would be a way to put it. Um, the most vital questions we generally ask um, existing large customers or new customers coming to market are what do they want to achieve? And, and in asking that, it, it's a bit of an unpacked question. So, you know, first and foremost, how many do you think you're going to need? A lot of people have these pie in the sky dreams that they're going to get their license and they're going to go to market and they're going to be selling 100,000, you know, jars on day one, or they're going to be selling, you know, 50 million pre-rolls in the first year. And it's, it's aspirational. It's generally not true. Um, so we try to get a realistic understanding of how many units they actually think they're going to move. Uh, we try to get a pretty good understanding of, A, if they've got budget constraints, but more importantly, operationally, how are they going to move that product? So people might come and tell us, oh, yeah, we've got four packaging lines and 17 people. And, you know, we think we can do 250 an hour, whatever that math might be. But generally speaking, they've forgotten about where are the products going to go, both when it comes in and where it goes out. So a lot of LPs had these great ideas, but they never budgeted for warehouse space. So it's very easy things that people didn't take into account. Um, in our business, which is packaging, it's fairly large and robust. So when you have a full uh, semi or, or full truck show up with 30 pallets of product and you haven't thought about where to store it and it's a hot summer month in Winnipeg, you've got to have some ideas on, on what you're going to do. So operationally, we try to unpack how it's going to work within their lines, how they're going to store it and how it's going to go out the door. Um, and then ultimately, you know, I think on day one, people had some great ideas around customization. There was a point where everything was customization, customization, customization. Um, there was a lot of money coming in from the capital markets, which were fueling some of these brand growths. Um, and while the customization projects are a lot of fun and we've launched some really good ones um, with the lean jar, for instance, I mentioned um, we're involved in the houseplant packaging for canopy, a few of the things that were sort of next level from early days in terms of just adding color and material into the space. Um, you're now seeing a bit of a reluctance to go into that custom role simply because the volumes to produce that and make it economically viable are not there, but equally um, it's more expensive. So everyone's looking at bottom lines. We try to understand what they're trying to approach and what they're trying to achieve in the market, how they want to stand out on shelf and how we can deliver something to them in a cost-effective manner, but ultimately bringing that educational piece about these are the things you need to think of. Um, because if, quite frankly, if you're not one of the larger LPs, you might not have the infrastructure in place to understand all these various elements and it can be, it can be daunting. So we try to bring that education around it and then give them the best opportunity to package their product on a line and speed that can make sense for their business. Yeah, definitely. And I, I really like that you pointed out the, the part about standing out on the shelves and, and obviously differentiating your products. Um, that goes to say with sending messages and getting those messaging across. Now, I want to ask you, um, obviously, innovation is a piece in any market and especially in packaging. I know you've touched on it a little bit with some of the new innovative formats that you guys have had. Um, but I guess, how do you determine um, what, what products or what, what forms of packaging the market wants and, and what you think consumers are going to be looking for. Can you talk a little bit about that process and, and how you, I guess, define innovation or drive innovation in your space? Sure. I mean, on day one, it was really about what can we get, how much can we get it, and, 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 and really what's the price. And, and we saw a lot of interesting decisions. So early days, and I'm sure Trina probably was involved in a lot of regulatory review on this, a lot of people were using secondary packaging. So you get... If we're talking dried flour, you'd get a jar, a cap, and a lot of people put it into a folded carton so it would sit nicely on shelf. Um, we were involved in a lot of those launches. And, you know, fast forward a couple of years, I don't think there's much, if any, secondary packaging in market because, A, 
it was expensive, it was time consuming, and the second and, and most customers couldn't even see it because all the product was behind the behind the counter somewhere. So it, we we saw an evolution there. Um, now there's a real interesting push towards sustainability, and we're seeing a ton of innovation. Um, we're heavily involved in a number of products um, which are either on their way to biocompostability, which isn't ever, some people say it's there, it's really not there yet today, which is mostly because municipalities don't have the ability to process and, and biodegrade product. Um, but where we're seeing a lot of interest um, on the sort of environmental side is looking at reclaimed plastics. And we've actually got a line of ocean bound plastics, which we're bringing to market. Um, so it's, it's actually plastic that's been reclaimed from rivers, which would then enter an ocean stream. Um, so we're looking at ways to do what we can to help the planet because we understand that it's cumbersome and a lot of times it's overpackaged to simply meet Health Canada regulations. So we're seeing a lot of innovation there. Um, and given the fact that child resistance is such a major component of what's required in this country for the legalized market, there's a bit of a limited opportunity simply because it's got a function. And there's only a few ways you can make something child resistant. And uh, trust me, we've tried just about every every one of them. So um, you're somewhat limited in how you can be innovative there. But we're trying to tie all these things together to make something that makes sense, ultimately for the consumer, for the LP, and for the planet. So, you know, work in progress, but we're trying to get there. Yeah, definitely. But I think you guys uh, definitely picked a good horse to bet on. Uh, I'm excited to see what you come up with on that. And then kind of in that same, same breath of uh, differentiating and making products kind of stand out, Obviously, the first thing that comes to my mind, aside from the packaging, is the advertising and marketing or, or how you just create demand around that. Um, so Trina, I, I do want to kick it over to you um, from a regulatory standpoint. If you want to talk a little bit about what kind of regulations are there around, around marketing or advertising or, or what are brands able to do? Sure. Just making a comment on Mark's point about child resistant packaging, you know, putting my medical cannabis Canada hat on for a moment. That's one of the issues that you know, we're lobbying to Health Canada about and will continue to pursue as part of the Cannabis Act review coming up in the fall, is that especially in the medical context, you know, does it make sense that, you know, we don't have a, a non-child resistant option for medical patients who have maybe joint and mobility issues and have are having a lot of difficulty opening the child resistant packaging? And you could even take it a step further and say, does it have any real need or benefit um, in, in, in enhancing public health and safety uh, when we're talking about low THC products, right? Like, do we really need child resistant packaging for a CBD topical, right? It, it's it's kind of overkill because again, it does, it does um, you know, put limitations on the type of packaging you can use. It does increase cost. And, you know, I think obviously innovation could be that much more enhanced if we're talking about products that don't necessarily need that, need that safety feature. So I think that's one of the like nuances that we have to continue to, Pester Health Canada about um, where I think there are improvements to the chain to the framework in all respects, but certainly with packaging um, that can be made while still respecting the public health and safety um, objectives that the government's uh, obviously going to continue to pursue. Um, but on the marketing side, you know that's another one obviously where the industry probably continues to be quite frustrated by the promotional restrictions that exist in the Cannabis Act and. And, you know, there's an absolute prohibition on promoting cannabis unless you can squeeze yourself into one of those limited number of exceptions. Um, and those exceptions are typically available only to license holders. Uh, so, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that the way you typically see these relationships between brand owners and processors structured as, is as licensing deals, but often there's a services component to that as well, because you know, technically, a, a brand owner is is not permitted under the Cannabis Act to go out and promote and market cannabis products in its own name on its own behalf. It could do so as a service provider or a contractor to a processor who is actually making and selling those products, though. So, you know, that's kind of where the um, the legal distinction is important, and the and the way that the the relationship is structured and characterized is important to you know for some brand owners. You know, every every deal that I've done with brand owners is a little bit different. No two are ever exactly the same. Some are very kind of laissez-faire. Here's my IP, take it and do what you want with it, and I'll wait for my royalty check. But more typically. Um, I think the short list of processors that are interested in engaging in these types of contract manufacturing relationships um, are expecting more from brand owners. And so you have to start thinking about 
Um, what role is the brand owner going to have in product development, um, in, in marketing and promotion, in the procurement of the non-cannabis ingredients, in the procurement of the packaging and the labeling for the products, um, in actually pounding the pavement and, and uh, doing the work with, with retailers and bud tenders to educate uh, them about the product and start to stimulate demand. So, you know, it's just really careful that important that all of those things are carefully structured to be in compliance because again you are when you're not a license holder under the cannabis act really restricted in what you can do uh so again doing it in your own name not okay doing it as a service provider to the processor that you are partnered with that's okay awesome thank you so much and uh Antoinette, now i want to kick it over to you and, and get some input from you um, how do you feel that you are able to bring a unique product to the market or a product that stands out on the shelves in this kind of sea of regulation that we have here that we refer to as the, the cannabis industry? Um, I'd love to get some insights from you on that. Yeah, I think to, to come up with like a unique product to market right now is, is, is really interesting because there's, there's so limited um, things that we can use and building a product on the market, right? But I think that what we can do is think about different applications on what it would be used for. So one of, one of my favorite products on the market that is finally on the market today is CBD isolate, just, just CBD isolate, like finally, I don't know, <laughs> it just took a little bit longer, but it's just, I love putting CBD isolate on my bowls on my on my joints on just like and not not only just putting it in water but it's where I get to finally show people all of the different ways that cannabis can be used right and in, in the legacy market we had so many type of different types of products now it's our job to find the unique way on how that fits within the regulatory right the regulatory market which I think is is one of the most beautiful parts it's it's kind of a mess, but it, it's beautiful in the sense where we can be, you know, a lot more safe in product application, but also educate people on all of the different forms that you can use cannabis. Cause we're still, there's still a huge learning curve. There's still people that are buying flour just by THC percentage, right. And are not truly understanding how they're using it. And yes, this could be recreational, but I think this still is an avid point of separating you from amongst all of the other cookie cutter products that we have out there today. Um, I haven't seen like a ton of culture in, in, in a lot of products, but I'm finding that they are now aligning themselves with different culture, like the Lost Craft deal, not the Lost Craft, the, um, the um, Ace Valley deal, of course, with like the cottage, the summer, the summertime, the, the, the festivals and of that nature. So I'm really excited to see more of that being done. And I have a few brands that I'm really look looking forward to see, but I think in terms of being innovative, it's finding those applications that we just don't get to talk about today. And I think that starts with just doing your research on cannabis and, and understanding why you truly love it and finding that specific niche in your, in your own vertical. And I think that's why there is so much opportunity for a lot of entrepreneurs and brands. I understand that so many of them feel like, oh, it's all monopolized. It's all taken over. There's hundreds of brands. There's no space for me. But there's so much space for you. This is still the very beginning stage. I don't want to say the beginning stage, but we're not we're not a mature industry yet. So there's tons of you know trial and error here, and there's tons of opportunities to spearhead you know new communities of cannabis consumers. And I'm really really excited about that. Finally, to have you know something that's been ingrained in Canadian culture to fully be you know destigmatized. And I think that there's beauty in that in entrepreneurship that can really be accessed if um, they find the right mentors and, um, and, and just do their research and learn. Yeah, you said so many, so many good things there that, that I agree with. And one thing that really resonated with me, it's, it's funny when we talk about uh, CBD isolate being kind of an innovative product when at its core in the industry, it's, it's such a pure form, right? But there are so many opportunities to that point exactly. Um, and TJ and Ashley, now um, for, for the two of you, having gone, uh, having gone through that process of, of what product to pick, um, to be innovative, to put in the market, and now going through that kind of marketing phase right now, um, I'd love to hear some of your experiences if, if you want to speak to that, um, some of the challenges of even getting that product out and, and going through that marketing right now, and, and ultimately what, what, was, uh, what you were able to do to, to generate the success. Well, we started off in the legal, uh, legacy market. This goes back five years ago, and one of the reasons why we were doing it was we wanted to help create and sustain local demand 
but it came at a high risk. Um, in the legacy market, we would go to events and watch events get shut down. Dispensaries would get raided. We would watch hundreds of our units just get taken away by the cops and police. And the, the risk was just so high. And really our story stems from Ashley um, struggling with Lyme disease mm -hmm. and trying to find a product on the market that would help her and her needs that wasn't just like your traditional like steroid or you know creams that are effective but they weren't necessarily something that you would want to use every day all day and um not just that but um cannabis oils inhaling all of that is something that we got interested in because of the passion to finding especially with the healthcare background something that we can use for ourselves, but also just from our experience, teach and educate the consumer, which were our clients at the time. And, um, you know, educating them in a way where we were even risking our licenses um, as um, in, in the field, if we were to get caught. So it was our mission to figure out a strategy, how can we bridge the market between legacy and legal and still be a cannabis brand and also create brand equity and value by actually advertising EKS. And how we did that was we removed the cannabis out of our product, which was so crazy to think of it. But then we said, okay, we're removing the cannabis, that sucks, but then we could partner up with licensed producers now and educate the consumer to go and purchase legal cannabis oil and now mix it into the topical. And that's what we did for two years. In that time, our challenges now were constantly pitching. We went from um, selling to just not getting any paychecks or paying ourselves for the past two years at all. It didn't matter. We, we scraped by and that, that was okay because we understood the value that if we could manage to successfully pull this off, we can be a face alongside with Antoinette and people that coming from the legacy market where we can say, you know what, these are premium high quality products because we know what the consumer wanted way back before the, the statistics are out even now. And we can ensure that, you know, sustainable packaging, high quality cannabis, and we're not just building a product and a brand to flip and get money right off the bat. It's people over profit. And that's what we believe since the very, very beginning. And that's why it was very important for us to find a licensed producer like processing that would align with our beliefs. Because you, over the course of two years, we went through, I don't know how many licensed producers, but we were saying no. We got to the point where we were actually saying no, because the first question would be, how much money can you make us? And we would get up from the room and walk out. Actually, that's true story. So, so by the time we got to peak, they were very infant in their stage. We we kind of didn't really trust that they were saying we're gonna get our license soon because we heard that story all the time. And we would talk to Trina, and she said, "Well, if they're saying they're gonna get it soon, it might not be for six months or a year." Like so, we heard all of these stories before, but there was something about peak that felt authentic because we have glass jars. We use Myron stash jars, which are reusable. Um, on the market, they sell empty for $25 to $50. So we invested high quality jars. We, we got um, iPhone style recyclable boxes. So it makes it giftable. And Peak never once tried to get us to switch, switch anything. Even as far as our herbal ingredients, it is probably a nightmare how they had to mix and formulate this for us because coming organic and natural is actually a lot harder than putting and whipping up a synthetic cream base. And they were up for the challenge and, and we did it because it's we launched now it's launched now. And um, we were actually uh, peaks first uh, product to market. So oh, the it's product. A very, put it very... out there. Let everyone see it. <laughs> I'm I'm working, shy this is your that. format. Put it out there. So we noticed. I, was say, Mark, I think I see the wheels turning as they're showing. No, it's like, the back you know, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta advertise, put it out there for people. It has that aha moment. So if anybody has never tried cannabis before it, they, they, you know, who doesn't, who throws away their iPhone boxes? I don't I still have all my, so this could be someone's first purchase. And then it's also like a historic thing they could keep forever. And then the jar is just, you know, your typical jar, but not so typical because it is a high quality jar, but um, it's a beautiful jar. 
we are obsessed with the uh, premium products, but at a lower price. Um, that's how we like to shop. And it was very important for us to go from legacy to legal so that we can be the voices to make sure that this executes in a way that that we need to see happen. And, and what we're noticing speaking to retailers and huge medical channels like shoppers is that they're not looking for the multi-million dollar companies. And for those people who are worried, like what you said about, oh, it's saturated and I, I, I'm just a small company. Well, guess what? The small craft brands is what is important right now because the multi-million dollar companies, people are smart enough now to understand like, okay, it's been there, done that, seen it. Let's try something different. And, and the community is more um, like, you'll see it with smaller retail stores. They're just more interested in supporting that. Even the OCS just launched last week a search bar through craft. So they've got their craft cannabis logo or whatever they put out there, but you can see that there's a market demand for craft. And yeah, and, and, and actually business, the amount of upcoming new LPs that are coming with, with you know smaller volume stuff, but it's 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 that's where the consumers want and it's it's really invigorating to see craft come back and you know it's gonna follow mm-hmm. the, it's gonna do the same thing. So Excited. Yeah, and, and to go on that point, and uh, with the OCS looking for craft, we were very shocked with just launching last week. We don't know how well we're doing, but what we do know is they they approached us and asked us to shoot a small little video for their Canada Day. And they selected eight to 10 brands out of hundreds to be featured on their website for like, hey, it's whoever, like, you know, just like something fun like that. So I think that projects what the future is in hold. Is in store for us for our smaller craft businesses, and I think there's an interest for that. So if you're thinking about it, just do just it. Do it. That's all I got. No, that was that was awesome. Thanks so much. And and I think your your passion just resonates and it's contagious. And I think anyone trying to change any of that would be crazy. So um, I congratulate you guys and, and say thank you to you both. Um, and kind of on that note, um, I think that passion and and sticking with the small small companies in the craft. Um, we definitely need more of that, I think, in the, in the cannabis space. And, and I know trying to bring that along, um, having resources available for these smaller groups coming in um, will be huge. And Anton, I want to make sure I give you some time probably at the, at the end here um, just to talk about that point. I know that's something that you're passionate and happily involved in. Um, but Trina and Mark, I'd be curious to know from, from your perspective, if you are approached by someone that doesn't have a lot of knowledge around the cannabis space, maybe isn't licensed or is looking for some information how do you two deal with that? Um, obviously, being larger groups and and being pretty powerful in your in your respective areas, um, is there kind of a, a direction you can send them for resources? Do you find that it's on your on your own to educate them? Um, Marcus, you're on mute. If you want to kick off, and then and Trina, I'd love to hear from you on this as well. Um, that's a great question. You know, we found early on that some LPs had quality assurance and regulated short assurance groups and teams and and. Some took it to the next level. Some were sort of looking to, to play with the rules a little bit. And you saw stuff early on um, with, you know, a couple of people where they were very brazen with the rules. You know, one, one large LP whose name starts with an A was, was taking some pretty, um, pretty interesting interpretations of what single uniform color should mean for our packaging. So, um, you know, you can, sort of, you can sort of go back and say people were willing to take risks. Some weren't. Um, and a lot of people at the smaller level just don't understand what some of the regulations, specifically around the labeling, comes down to. It's, you know, white space and, and font space, and it, it's, it's pretty complex. And um, our, um, our executive director, Hillary Lieberman, who's not on this, um, I would argue pound for pound is the most knowledgeable regulatory packaging labeling specification uh, individual within the Canadian cannabis space. And early on, pre-legalization, I think she worked on... I'm going to say there's around 175 or 200 different label designs across multiple LPs. Um, and, and we don't really offer that as a service anymore, but you're able to leverage experience. And I think Trina would be the first to say, if you don't know, ask someone who knows, because it's extremely complex. And the last thing you need is to be subject to a recall or something that isn't necessarily within uh, the black and white framework of the league of the rules. And you can get yourself in trouble and it can be costly and, and dangerous. So um, generally speaking, you know, you've got a lot of experts and I'm assuming Peak probably offers that same service where you guys have to become knowledge experts when it came to all forms of regulatory. Otherwise, you're putting your business, your license 
and your portfolio companies at risk. So, um, you know, it's it, surrounding yourself with a knowledge base that works. And, and Trina, I don't know, I'm curious to hear your thoughts, but I assume it's similar along those lines. Yeah, I mean, I, I often tell clients, you know, this is all I do. This is all I do all day, every day. And I'm still learning every single day. I am far from, you know, the master of all things cannabis regulatory. So it's really impossible to be um, a complete subject matter expert, you know, from top to bottom. And it's really about, you know, at least understanding what you just appreciating at least what your level of sophistication and knowledge is and building a team around you to fill the gaps, right? So it doesn't all necessarily have to rest within your brain, but you have to have access to the people who can fill those gaps for you. And really there's no substitute. I mean, I, you know, do what I did, just, you know, read, read articles, go to, go to conferences, like webinars, I guess for now, like this, make contacts in the industry, make connections, um, talk to people that are licensed, uh, you know, learn from their, you know, just like internet saying, learn, learn from other people's mistakes and, and try to learn from the wisdom that they've picked up along the way. And, um, you know, it, it, you know, again, depending on what stage of the of the process you're at, um, you know, the further you get into it, when you're actually into product, you know, manufacturing and sale, obviously, you're knee deep in the weeds of regulatory compliance. And you're, you know, thinking about new product notifications and label compliance and ingredient lists and all of these things, they can get very, very technical and detailed. And, you know, you just have to make sure that somebody is covering that off for you if it's not you personally. Do you think, do you think we're going to see more changes in the fall, Trina? Like we've sort of gone through now what I would call like 2.5 changes because we started off pre-legalization, then, you know, Schedule 2 came out and then we had 2.0. Do you think they're going to be sort of relaxing stuff in your opinion, even, even maybe along branding elements or is it still pretty firm ahead? Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to even see what the scope of this review really is, right? That hasn't been announced by Health Canada yet. In my last discussions with Health Canada on this issue, they were still really developing what this review was going to consist of and entail. And if you look at what the Act says, the review is really about how has the Cannabis Act um, affected public health and safety? How has it affected access to cannabis by minors? Those are the, it's really about it's really about risk and, 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 and that's what the, the, you know, have we failed as a society because we legalize cannabis? That's what it's about. Not about did the rules we make really make sense and perhaps should they be loosened up in some respect? Um, so it'll be interesting to see how Health Canada just kind of frames the review and how much opportunity there's going to be for stakeholders to really give their input to Health Canada on all of these kind of smaller issues, but ones that can really have a positive impact on the industry. Um, you know, I think, I think the fact is that whether they create the space for us to do that or not, we're still going to do it uh, because there's so much, um, you know, room for finessing and tweaking and making improvements. I don't really foresee any kind of major holeless yeah. bolus changes as a, as a part of this review, but the fact is there's, there's been changes you know, even pre-legalization when we were in a medical system, Health Canada made many changes to the regulations over the years, um, some very significant ones. And sometimes it's done just by way of policy change, right? So it may not even be an actual regulatory change, but just their position on certain things where they, they've they recognized in certain respects, we over-regulated here. We've got enough of a track record behind us that we can see we don't need full concrete bunker vaults for cannabis to be stored in. We don't need to have cameras covering every Post square inch of a vaults. grow room. You know, there were a lot of respects in which Health Canada has pulled back and adjusted its position. And I think they're very open generally to, to very well-reasoned policy discussions um, where they are rooted in public health and safety, right? You know, I always suggest to clients, if you're pitching Health Canada to make some sort of policy change or regulatory change, you have to focus on how this will, you know, enhance or at least not detract from or put public health and safety at risk, right? That has to be the baseline. And then you can add on why is this good for patients or why is this going to help reduce costs for producers? How is this going to facilitate logistics? And, you know, all of that you can layer on top, but the baseline has to be this is not going to put the public at risk. Yeah. 
yeah, I think those are all, as people in the industry, those are all things we're, we're hoping to push forward, but I'm understanding it takes some time, but thank you for that. And then I'm um, kind of to, to finish this, this segment off in this session off your answer. And I do want to uh, leave it with you. If you don't mind talking about kind of some of the resources that you're, you're aware of, or some of the resources that, that you yourself possibly are working on um, just to help tear down some of these barriers and really uh, allow more of an entry or, or give understanding how people can enter or, or groups can enter the space. Thank you. And in terms of like resources, I always say like, just, just use me guys. I've been around for so long. <laughs> I, just know so, I just know so much and I can't do it all myself. You know, I have a Google Drive with like hundreds of different cannabis business plans that I just have randomly when I think about them. And, but there's just so, there's so much potential. So in terms of resources, um, you know, I, I love the Green Rush program. This is why we have, you know, manufacturers globally. We have, you know, funding arms if you need, if you need, you know, a loan, if you need debt capital raises, like those are the type of things that we can do with. There's, there's just so much to it. I just put it all in one place for you guys at the Green Rush program to make a lot more, um, you know, accessible. I did want to talk about our social, uh, our social equity piece that we've done. So I've noticed that a lot of LPs and cannabis retailers are loving what we're doing with the Green Rush program, and they actually want to do more. I also started the Green Rush program because I acknowledge that I'm one of the very few pe people of color in this space, and I really do want to make it a more inclusive industry. Um, so what we've done is a lot of the mentors on our program work at the world's largest LPs here, right? So they all um, have tremendous value. So what they do is they give an hour of their time to our students as much as they need, but we start with an hour of their time. And um, after that hour, they get to either get paid either $100 an hour, or they can put that off and go towards our BIPOC fund. So we actually have tons of scholarships. So if you find that the program's not affordable for you, but you still want to bring a product to mar market, it is literally funded by LPs, by retailers, by the industry that does want it to be a more inclusive industry. And we have, you know, partners in terms, even for e-commerce, um, you know, accessory companies. I think that's such an opportunity for cannabis consumers who just want to be a part of it, but don't want to be at the heavy, like, business side of things when it comes to bringing a, a cannabis compliant product to market. Um, you know, that's a whole different side of thing, having payment processors, you know, how, understanding how to, like, market legally. We work with other cannabis influencers that have done it themselves. And we work with boutique agencies that are ready, you know, hash out these deals with these LPs and, and market and brand with you as well. So there's so many ways that you can do it. What I love with the program is that it's so personalized because there's so much to it. Um, but in terms of resources, networking, and just following, you know, all of these different cannabis companies and getting what's involved with the news, there's so much that hasn't been done. So it's really like the culture is the most important thing to be tapped into, I feel, in this industry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. So you guys are doing some amazing work on that, that end for sure. And, and I totally agree that networking events like this, thanks to Marigold for putting this on, obviously in WWC, um, just being able to get in front of people and communicate, hear the stories, uh, I totally agree is, is the best way to learn. Um, now, I guess what, so going to some of the audience questions, one that I, I am personally curious, and I did see pop up in here myself, and uh, Trina, I do want to pose this one to you first. Um, what product are you most excited to see come into the to that market space next? Well, I, I would say EKS, but they're already it's already there. So already you know. there. <laughs> um, listen, I, I think for me, you know, my my heart and my passion still rests with medical access, right? So I still um, am in, interested to hear the patient perspective on what what do you need to to enhance your cannabinoid therapy and so things like suppositories that's something we hear over and over again and how does it, how do we make cannabis therapy more accessible more um, appropriate for your particular condition or symptom that you're treating and more effective for you right so so to me those are the products that get me the most excited and those are the types of things that you know I hear from patients so um, looking forward to that I'd love to add to that because I've been working on suppositories for eight years and we're finally getting them onto the market in Canada. And I love this legacy to legal story that Tijin and Ashley has shared with us, but it's very rocky road. Like coming from legacy to legal can also put a huge target on your back. You can be easily flagged by Health Canada from becoming um, 
in the legal business, right? So there's a lot of risk involved, which I love telling people in the Green Rush program. And if anybody reach out to me, I want to make sure you guys are protected, especially like women and minorities are we were held to as a double standard. So there's, there's a, enough to talk about there. But in terms of medical products, I don't want entrepreneurs to be scared about medical products because it takes a lot more to get it to market. I, as a college dropout, has hired a Harvard grad who used to work at Pfizer to lead my medical, um, my, he was my CMO, my, my chief medical officer. So you can do these things in cannabis it's just knowing how to find your role within the industry. You do have value, you do have expertise, and I just want to help you guys put it all together. So thanks so much for having me. But the medical component is a huge industry, and I don't want it to be unseen because there's so much potential there, and I feel like it's often overlooked. So thanks for sharing suppositories, Trina. Also waiting for cannabis health products, right? That's another big one that we're waiting for announcements on, which is going to be a game changer yes. if we do move in that direction. I am uh, I am excited for that as well um, on my end. But TJ and Ashley, before we finish off with Mark, what, what are you guys looking forward to seeing coming to the market? Once. Um, I am hands so, down internet, yeah. women's health, yeah, suppository, women's health, anything related to things that make people uncomfortable to talk about. Um, we're all about that. And uh, I love the feeling of we're, we're in, we're in our rebels. So we like to stir pot, stir the pot a little bit, you know, um, talk about, you know, even going to schools and talking about cannabis and having moms be upset with us. We're all about it. So, um, <laughs> that's just the, the name of the game and the products that, um, align with health and wellness. I believe the OCS doesn't have a health and wellness category, but we're really pushing on making the effort to ensure that that happens. And we do have, feel like within a year from now, they will have a category that is specific to health and wellness. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, those types of products is important to us. So. We'd love to chat with you more, Antoinette, afterwards. Awesome. Thank you. And then, Mark, uh, I heard you you come in with the blunts. Is that correct? Yeah, but it's for a different reason than you think. Okay. Hey, no no judgment. I, I if we get to no blunts, it means, we're, it means we get through COVID. And that's okay. the reality. We, we, we do a tremendous business in the pre-roll space, mm -hmm. and it went from half-gram joints to one gram joints to now 0.33 gram joints. And the reason is no one's sharing them. And I'm not saying ever again, people are gonna share them, but blunts are actually now approved by Health Canada, the actual physical blunt papers, which is yeah. something we do business in. And the second we get to the point where there's joints this big, it means we're all together and we're all sharing it. And I think we're, the light's starting to get to the end of the tunnel on that. So I'm hoping we can get to a communal, uh, a communal 420 in uh, at Queens Park would be a lot of fun, where we can all stand together without masks and and all the fun stuff uh, to get life back to normal. So that's that's what I'm most excited for. No, I appreciate you calling that out. You're you are totally right. I do miss myself that kind of community aspect. Um, that's I think what draws a lot of people into cannabis, and I know personally what drew me in. So I can't wait till we get to, back to that state as well. Um, but I see Tracy here coming on. So just before we we sign off here, I do want to say thank you to all the speakers. Um, awesome conversation and all the audience members for tuning in. Thanks so much.